Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss biochemical differential tests related to nutrient utilization and combination differential media. This is the eighth in a series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my online Laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include observing and describing the processes and byproducts of utilization of various nutrients by different bacterial species. We will become familiar with the concepts of catabolic and anabolic reactions, endoenzymes, exoenzymes, ureases, reductases, hydrolytic enzymes, and hemolysins. Again, please note that the biochemical enzymatic reactions included in lab 7 and 8 require the use of BSL-2 microbes, which cannot be done safely at home, so there are no wet lab procedures for these two labs. Enzymes are what is known as a catalyst. A catalyst helps to speed up chemical reactions and they're not used or changed during a chemical reaction and therefore they're reusable. Proteins called enzymes serve as catalysts for biochemical reactions that play an important role in controlling cellular respiration and metabolism. An enzyme functions by lowering the activation energy, which is the energy needed to form or break chemical bonds. Chemical reactants to which enzymes bind are called substrates, and the location within the enzyme where the substrate binds is called the enzyme's active site. Enzymes are known for their specificity. In fact, as an enzyme binds to its substrates, the enzyme structure changes just like a rubber glove molds to a hand inserted into it. Overall, there is a specifically matched enzyme for each substrate and thus for each chemical reaction. So I bring this up in lab 8 because we have seen enzymatic reactions in labs 6 and 7. But in those two labs, I wanted to focus more on other topics, whereas in this lab, we're looking much more specifically at, does this bacteria produce this very specific enzyme? So in lab seven, we were looking at fermentation and cellular respiration more than we were looking at enzyme production. In lab eight, we're looking more at, can this bacteria use this sole source of carbon in this media? In other words, does this bacteria make the enzyme that is needed in order to break down this nutrient and use it in their metabolism. So before we can really get too deep into that, we definitely have to make sure we understand enzymes and enzymatic reactions. So let's look at anabolic and catabolic reactions. The term anabolic, and also referred to as anabolism, refers to endergonic metabolic pathways involved in biosynthesis, converting simple molecular blocks into more complex molecules. So, for instance, building a carbohydrate from simple sugars, or building DNA from nucleic acid. Conversely, the term catabolism refers to exergonic pathways that break down complex molecules into simpler ones. Catabolic enzymes break down micro molecules via catabolism so that these molecules can cross and enter the bacterial cell membrane. Specific catabolic enzymes must be produced by specific microbes in order for them to be able to utilize the only available sources of carbon, nitrogen, or sulfur in a given type of artificial media. So primarily in lab 8 we are looking at catabolic enzymes, endoenzymes acts inside the cell, so for example, building proteins from amino acids, that's going to be happening inside the cell. Those are endoenzymes. Those are anabolic reactions. Whereas exoenzymes, these are enzymes that are working outside of the cell and they're breaking down larger molecules so that they're small enough that the cell can bring them in. So exoenzymes are associated with catabolic reactions and essentially what is happening is the cell is eating. It's eating the stuff that's outside of it using enzymes that break it down. Let's look at hydrolysis. In the reading and in the lecture course, you're familiar with dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis is the most common type of anabolic reaction, and it's used to link monomers into polymers. Hydrolysis is going to be exactly the opposite of a dehydration synthesis reaction. It is a catabolic reaction which breaks polymers apart and forms monomers using water and enzyme. So that's where the hydro part comes in is water, and the lysis means to break. It's breaking polymers into monomers using water. 
Hydrolytic enzymes hydrolyze carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins outside the cell into their substituents to be transported into the cell. So they are, hydrolytic enzymes are exoenzymes and they are performing catabolic reactions. Some bacteria can produce amylase and maltase to break starch down into glucose, which is then used to make ATP via glycolysis. Starch hydrolysis, right? This is the reaction. You start with starch, then you have amylase is the enzyme that breaks starch down into dextrin. Amylase is still present in the cell because enzymatic reactions do not use or break down or change the enzyme. So it's still there and it can be used again to break down dextrin into maltose. And then maltase breaks maltose down into glucose. And then glucose, if you remember, is the starting molecule for glycolysis. Starch is one of the most biologically important polysaccharides in addition to glycogen and cellulose. It is composed of large polymers made up of hundreds of monosaccharide monomers. So starch is very big. If you're looking at sugars versus carbohydrates versus starches, essentially the main difference is size. Sugars are simple sugars are maybe a monomer or two monomers linked together. Carbohydrates are like a chain of monomers and starches are like a whole web of monomers. But Essentially, a starch is a very big sugar, and these enzymes here can break it down to make it a very small sugar. For experiment two, you're going to read through this tutorial. For experiment one, you're going to watch this video in which two species of bacillus bacteria are tested for starch hydrolysis. Bacillus are acetophilic and they are endospore forming bacteria. Therefore, they can tolerate the low pH of the PDA media. And some can also hydrolyze starch, which is abundant in PDA. Potato dextrose agar has a lot of starch in it. Iodine is used to visualize the hydrolyzed clear zones this here in the media because iodine reacts with starch and it changes to a bluish blackish color so you see this black around here and also sometimes it's just kind of a dark brown iodine reacts with starch in this way it will turn this dark dark color and that is how you can see where the starch is intact still and where it has been hydrolyzed so this lighter zone of hydrolysis here means that this species is positive for starch hydrolysis and then the fact that you have the dark color around here means that this species is negative for hydrolysis. And you're saying, well, there's a zone of hydrolysis on the other side of this bacteria. And it's like, yeah, because this bacteria is hydrolyzing the starch rapidly enough to where it's actually started breaking down all of this in the middle. And if you let this go long enough, if you let this incubate long enough, it probably would hydrolyze all the starch in the plate. Okay, next we're going to look at another type of hydrolysis, the gelatin hydrolysis. For experiment two, you're going to read through this tutorial, and it's going to take you through the concept of gelatin hydrolysis and how testing for gelatin hydrolysis help differentiate certain genera of bacteria. It is important to know that gelatin is a protein derived from collagen, a component of the vertebrate connective tissue. Gelatinases comprise a family of extracellular enzymes produced and secreted by some microbes in order to hydrolyze gelatin. Subsequently, the gel can take up individual amino acids and use them for metabolic purposes. The presence of gelatinases can be detected using nutrient gelatin, a simple test medium composed of gelatin, peptone, and beef extract. The nutrient gelatin differs from most other solid media in that the solidifying agent is also the substrate for enzymatic activity. Consequently, a tube of nutrient gelatin is stab inoculated with a gelatinase positive organism. Secreted gelatinase or gelatinases will liquefy the media. If it is negative for gelatinase production, the organisms do not secrete the enzyme and do not liquefy the media. So this is pretty simple. If the bacterium produces gelatinase, the media is going to go from solid to liquid. So this is a positive test here. And if it doesn't produce this enzyme, it stays solid. Okay, let's look at blood hemolysis. Uh, blood hemolysis tests detect the presence of exotoxins called hemolysins. 
which are able to destroy red blood cells and hemoglobin. Blood agar, sometimes called sheep blood agar, because it includes 5% sheep blood in triptych soy agar base, allows for differentiation of bacteria based on their ability to hemolyze red blood cells. The three major types of hemolysis are beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis, depending on the amount and type of deg degradation. For experiment three, you're going to watch the video at this link, and you should be able to describe which species shows alpha or beta hemolysis in that video. Alpha hemolysis is the partial destruction of red blood cells. It produces a greenish brown discoloration of the agar around the colonies. Alpha hemolysis sort of makes the media look like a bruised apple. If you've ever seen, like if somebody drops an apple on the ground, you pick it up and it's got kind of this weird brownish color. That is what alpha hemolysis looks like. Beta hemolysis is the complete destruction of red blood cells and hemoglobin and results in a clearing of the media around the colonies. In other words, you can see right through a beta hemolysis plate. And then gamma hemolysis is actually no hemolysis at all. It's negative. So it's going to appear as simple growth with no change to the media at all. Both alpha and beta results are considered positive for hemolysins, whereas gamma is negative. For experiment four, you're going to be looking at a, yet another type of hydrolysis. This is going to be the test for urea hydrolysis. Urea is a product of carboxylation of certain amino acids. It can be hydrolyzed to ammonia and carbon dioxide by bacteria containing the enzyme urease. The only nutrients in the urea slant agar are going to be urea and a trace of yeast extract. Phenol red, again, is the indicator that's used to expose any increase in pH. So for this one, you're looking to see if the increase, if the pH has increased. And that's because you have urea in water that gets broken down by urease into carbon dioxide, water, and then ammonia. And this ammonia will raise the pH because it generates hydroxide ions upon reaction with water. So you have urea and water, urease breaks that down to carbon dioxide, water, and ammonia. And then the ammonia further breaks down into the NH4 and hydroxide. And this hydroxide is what turns the media from yellow to pink. And in this case, the pink color indicates a urease positive organism, whereas orange and yellow are both considered negative for urease. For the report, be sure you note the chemical reactions taking place, how the test is performed, and which species test positive for urease activity. For experiment five, you will perform a simulated coagulase test at this link here. Coagulase works in conjunction with normal plasma components to form protective fibrin barriers around individual bacterial cells, and this shields them from phagocytosis and other types of host attack. The coagulase test is used routinely to differentiate Staphylococcus aureus from other species of Staphylococcus. And Staphylococcus aureus can be highly resistant to both normal immune response and antimicrobial agents due in part to its production of coagulase. A coagulase positive test is a semi-solid clot and a negative coagulase test is liquid because you use plasma for conducting a coagulase test and it starts out as liquid. And if it stays liquid, then it's negative. But if after you inoculate a coagulase test tube and incubate it, you have either all solid like this, this is actually pretty unusual. Usually you just have clumps, like little clots, or it's possibly going to be kind of liquefied, but with chunks in it, that's going to be positive for coagulase. The citrate test was designed to identify specific genera within the Enterobacteraceae family that can utilize sodium citrate as their sole carbon source. Using the enzyme citrate permease to transport citrate into the cell and metabolize it by way of the fermentative pathway. Inorganic ammonium salt is used as the sole nitrogen source. Breakdown of ammonium salt produces ammonia and hydroxides. So we know that the ammonia and hydroxides, again, is going to increase the pH. 
hydroxyl ions are going to raise the pH and it changes the color from bromophenol blue indicator, right? It starts out as green before you inoculate it. And after you inoculate it with a specimen and incubate it, if it stays green, then that means it is negative. It is not utilizing the citrate. It is not per a bacterial species that can produce citrate permease. It is negative. But if it turns blue, that means the pH has gone up, which means that those byproducts have been produced the citrate is being utilized, the ammonium salt has been broken down, and there are ammonia and hydroxides present in the media now, which has made the pH go up. So it's gone from green to blue, that means it's positive. So again, for experiment six, you're going to be watching a video about this test and recording your observations. You want to include the indicator dye that's used, which specimen is positive, and how those results are observable. The last experiment for lab eight is the combination differential media. You're gonna be watching this video here. Combination differential media is also called SIM media, and it's called SIM media because SIM stands for sulfur indole motility. It's used for the determination of sulfur reduction, indole production from tryptophan hydrolysis, and motility. It is a semi-solid media that includes casein and animal tissue as sources of amino acids, iron and sulfur in the form of sodium thiosulfate. Uh, sulfur reduction to hydrogen sulfide can be accomplished by bacteria by the enzymes cytosine disulfurase or by the enzyme thiosulfate reductase. Either reaction will produce the H2S gas, which reacts with ferrous ammonium sulfate in the media to produce ferric sulfide, which results, results in a black precipitate. So you can observe the reduction of the sulfur in the media if you see a black precipitate. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it can tell you is if it produces indole. Indole production is made possible by the presence of tryptophan contained in the casein and animal protein. Bacteria possessing the enzyme tryptophanase can hydrolyze tryptophan to pyruvate, ammonia, and indole. The hydrolysis of tryptophan can be detected by the addition of COVAX reagent after a period of incubation. COVAX reagent contains dimethyl amino benzyl aldehyde and hydrogen chloride dissolved in amyl alcohol. When a few drops of COVAX are added to the top of the tube, the dimethyl amino benzyl aldehyde reacts with any indole that's present and produces a red reagent layer on the top of the media. And then finally, motility. Um, motility can be determined just because it's a deep. So if you perform a stab inoculation and then you incubate it, you should be able to see if the bacteria moved throughout the media or if it did not. But you can do that with any deep, honestly. You can test for motility with any deep. The tests that are specific to sim media are going to be your hydrogen, sulfide, and indole. So in these tubes here, you've got an example of negative for sulfur reduction here, positive for tryptophan hydrolysis. And you can tell because of the color. The color for a positive indole test is going to either be blood red or hot pink. If you have brown like this, that is negative. You also could have clear or milky white or yellow. Any of those is negative for indole. In order for it to be positive, it has to be blood red or a hot pink color. But anyway, so this one is positive for indole, negative for sulfur reduction. This one is negative for both. This one is negative for indole, but positive for sulfur reduction. You can tell because of the black precipitate in the media. This one here is positive for indole and positive for H2S. So for your obs observations, I did uh, compile this image here. Because there are seven different experiments in this lab, and you're going to be kind of bouncing back and forth from this video to that video to this tutorial to that simulation. I've kind of put them all together here to help you with your interpretations. So this one here is the starch hydrolysis. Again, this is a positive, this is a negative. Gelatin hydrolysis, positive, negative. Beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, gamma. Urease, negative, urease, positive. Coagulase, positive and negative. Citrate, negative, positive. This one here is positive for motility, negative for H2S. 
negative for indole. This one is positive for H2S, positive for indole. And you wouldn't be able to tell what the motility is in this media because the precipitate is kind of blocking your view. So that's all of the typical results you should see for these experiments. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics. And leave your questions for me in the comments below.